Shane Wasick is the owner and founder of Basking Sharks Scotland, an operation with an impressive and passionate professional team of qualified marine scientists and divers who offer innovative wildlife tours based in Oban in the Hebrides on the west coast of Scotland. Shane has built his dream business around a childhood experience with basking sharks and is driven to enable others in gaining life-changing moments with these gentle giants in the wild too. Thank you for joining me today, Shane, to talk about basking sharks. No worries. Good to meet you. Yeah, you too. Um, can you share with us your transformational experience as a young man with basking sharks and how that experience came about um, to shape your life? Yeah, uh, well, obviously, um, many people don't really consider uh, or, or yeah, think about megafauna and Scotland in the same uh, breath. But uh, even though we're, you know, at the top of the world in the north um, and maybe cold and rainy in some people's uh, eyes, uh, we do have amazing wildlife here as well. So it's not just the tropics that have, you know, uh, lots of life. Our temperate oceans are an explosion of life in the summertime. Um, we have seasonal seas, so we have uh, things like kelp forests and, uh, you know, big plankton blooms that feed uh, shoals of fish. And then we have the megafauna like whales and dolphins and bass and sharks and uh, even leatherback turtles and sunfish uh, come here in the summer. So we actually have lots and lots of uh, marine life here that you wouldn't necessarily, or, or many people wouldn't uh, uh, consider that would live here. Um, so uh, we, a lot of people do take it for granted a little bit, or, or maybe even in Scotland don't know about it, um, generally because it's just a little bit further away. So off of the West Coast, um, we have the islands called the Hebrides, um, and they just sit off into the Atlantic a little bit. So uh, they are known as obviously a beautiful place to, to visit. Um, but, uh, you know, unless you're really getting out into the environment and on the boat and things like that, you maybe would miss it a little bit if you lived in the city kind of thing. So maybe similar to other places around the world. Um, but yeah, so when I, I grew up beside the sea and, um, you know, I kind of, was, uh, you know, saw this stuff from a young age and was, um, you know, out in the boat and running about around the rock pools and sand dunes and all that kind of stuff so I was just immersed in it from a young age and um, all I kind of wanted to do from you know being a, a young laddie uh, was wanting to be diving and out there and seeing stuff and obviously that transformed into then doing marine biology at uni and um, uh, you know doing all my commercial and scientific diving and all that stuff and then it just followed from there and <clears throat> uh, obviously when I was uh, out doing diving trips and doing different things then um, then we came across the sharks at that time, you know, obviously absolutely amazing experience. Uh, and obviously at the time, I think back, um, you know, maybe just as a young, a young lad or whatever, you maybe didn't really take it. I mean, obviously it was amazing, but you maybe didn't quite appreciate it as much as you do when you're older. Yeah. So we <clears throat> went off traveling for a few years and lived in New Zealand and around the South Pacific and obviously had a, a lot of cool experiences there <clears throat> with, uh, with different marine life. Uh, but it wasn't until we came back and then we sort of thought, well, you know, we actually have really amazing stuff, you know, at home and our doorstep, you know, and all these things that we've done, the people that we've met would all love this as well. So it wasn't really until I went away and came back and thought about it a little bit um, that, you know, we should really celebrate what we've got on our own doorstep. And uh, over the last uh, many years, uh, we've found that, yeah, lots of people want to travel to Scotland with us and um, meet the Bastion Sharks. Uh, we have the biggest aggregation of them uh, in the world in the summertime, um, and we're right in the middle of the hotspot. And obviously, it's just one of these things that maybe people here don't appreciate what yeah. we do have on our doorstep. Yeah. And uh, it, it just took you know, my passion from when being younger and going away uh, and then kinda then realizing to put it all together. And here we are, I guess. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Now, can you create for us a mental picture of what a typical day out on the water with your team looks like and how you facilitate providing that breathtaking experience for others looking um, to come for basking sharks? Uh, so first of all, normally what we do is we get our survival suits on and we brave the gale force winds and the storms and we get out there and mountainous seas and all the rest of it. Uh, but yeah, normally in the summertime we have um, some reasonable weather um and uh, you know an ideal day would be nice and flat calm and sunny it means all the plankton come up to the surface uh, and then the sharks come up and feed in that zone as well um so we base ourselves out in the hebrides uh so the islands just to the west of the mainland uh, the people get to us by the ferry 
Um, and it's a lovely little community. Uh, the island's maybe 13 miles long by three miles wide and maybe 150 people live there. Uh, very, um, not pristine, but uh, you know, it's been, uh, there's not many people live there. So there's a small impact uh, recently on, on, the, on the environment. So it's a lovely place to, to be. Um, so, you know, we'd be sailing out the harbor on our, on our ribs. So we've got a uh, big 12 meter cabin ribs built for the Atlantic. Uh, and then any time from when we come out of the harbour, there's a big drop off there. Um, and then as we go further down the island, there's a gap between two islands where the water moves in and out. Uh, and in that time or that place, we get um, the plankton getting pushed through that gap, kind of like an egg timer. Um, so all that food concentrates. So uh, we'd obviously be um, heading down there on the boat, keeping a lookout for fins on the surface because we need to um, have the sharks at the surface to be able to spot them. It's not like a a predatory shark where we could maybe visit a sea mount or or you know there's a feeding thing going on um, we kind of have it depends on the plankton where the basking sharks yeah. are at any given time so yeah so um we would everyone be yeah. in out the back looking for the sharks and uh, it's spotting not the them. Only thing, it's not the only thing you're out there for um of course basking sharks is a is a highlight but you have some other fantastic things to see yeah, like, uh, again, as soon as we come out of the harbour, we can have uh, minke whales, uh, we have common dolphins and rissles dolphins, um, porpoises, uh, many other species like that. We have a resident um, pod of orca, um, and then obviously lots of seabirds as well, because all these things are interlinked, and, you know, we have the plankton, and that feeds the fish, and then, you know, the birds and the whales and everything else feeds on the fish, mm -hmm. so we have big aggregations. And then, of course, uh, we have um, our seasonal... Uh, um, birds the puffins that arrive and they're mm. quite a big thing on people's lists to see yeah. uh, many people actually think they're very large um, but they're actually quite tiny they're only maybe um yeah about uh, 12 inches high uh, so yeah. people think they're kind of like a quite a penguin -y type thing but they are really small and obviously the big the big beak so that's we have a we have a short period where both the puffins and the sharks are in a good space in terms of opportunity to see them so mm. uh, those weeks are always special when when we get to see them you know it's uh, great to see all these things you know obviously gray seals as well which many people don't see so you can really hit up a lot of things in a week so like on a week tour for example you would hope to see that you know swim with some gray seals get in the water with bass and sharks see the puffins whales and dolphins uh, and then that obviously the kelp forest and all the different species that lives there yeah. so certainly people um, from overseas that have never really been into a temperate environment um, uh, you know maybe on the outset people would think mm, i'm not sure if it's a bit cold and things like that but really it's a whole new experience a whole new range of marine life to discover um, yeah. that they wouldn't have seen before so we do see that a lot that people have been on uh have been a lot to warm destinations but this is just a completely new set of things to to kind of see so uh, most people are really stoked on you know seeing yeah. all these different new things so from a marine biologist standpoint, what is it about the basking shark that most amazes you? What features do they have that most impress you? Oh, <laughs> how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> Just got a little basking shark here. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, they're so unique. They're so unique in terms of the shark world. Um, and that's why they've become a, a, like a kind of a you know, a sought after species to see because they are so different. Um, and, I do, and I do quite like it because they are hard to find um, and you can't bait them. You can't, we can't do anything to attract them or, or to do anything. We just need to use our knowledge uh, and interpret what's happening in the environment to try and be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the challenge, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I like that it's not a given and, you know, there is a lot of, you know, luck or, or things coming together to see them. Uh, but, you know, they're like one of three planktivores. They um, have completely evolved to be efficient on, um, you know, feeding on plankton, mm -hmm. um, zooplankton. Um, they are in the order of lamniforms, so they are related to white sharks. So when they close their mouth, most people just, you know, know a basking shark by this huge mouth, which is also amazing as well, you know, this big one meter like your mouth. shirt. <laughs> So when they close their mouth, they look, you know, almost like exactly like a great white. So, um, and they still have actually teeth on the outside of their, uh, yeah. of their jaw as well. So there's so many different levels of, um, of thing that are interesting about them. Uh, and when you get in the water, uh, uh, you know, um, anatomically they are, they've got very interesting features. So they've got a tiny little brain um, and they're all just very, 
built just to be uh, so efficient at what they do. Mm. Um, so some people think they're kind of mindless, but they look very prehistoric. People think when they see them, yeah. they just they look like a remnant from you know millions of years ago that have you know still retained yeah. here. Um, Incredible and, and that's knowledge. Probably true. Yeah, yeah, they probably haven't evolved very much. Um, or, you know, they've obviously evolved to their little niche, but then after that, you know, there's there's no competition, there's no predators generally. Uh, you know, there's no there's no need for them to do very much more. So, yeah. and there's nothing for them to change either. So, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, good thing and, works. And kind of, you know, just amazing from that point of view. Uh, but then there's so many other things that uh, are, uh, are incredible. That uh, like say they eat these tiny plankton, and they're only you know three to five millimeters long. You know, they have to feed all day, all night to, to, you know, get enough energy. But the sharks actually still breach out of the water. They're actually the largest shark in the world to do so. So you, there's all these crazy, you know, paradoxes or whatever that, you know, eat these tiny little things and they're so built for efficiency and, you know, not moving very much and only feeding when it's right. But then they just explode out of the water uh, yeah. and, you know, they burn off, you know, three days worth of plankton or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> So it's pretty so amazing, you know. Have you have you seen this from under the water? Like, have you have you seen one prepare itself for a breach, or is it something you've only seen from the surface? Well, yeah, we've actually got it on drone. I've never seen it in the water myself, um, but we've actually got it on drone where we had the boat and then the swimmers, and then there was two sharks approaching, and then suddenly they just uh, both sort of simultaneously dived, swam underwater, and then breached on the other side of them. But it was kind of you know far enough away that you wouldn't see it. But obviously, we saw it on the drone and we saw it from yeah. the boat. Uh, but, you know, it's still a several ton animal and, you know, as yeah. impressive as it is, you know, I want to see it, but, you know, maybe just a little bit. Further away from so, the snorkelers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So it's cool to watch it, but you're like, oh, you know, that's okay. At that distance, we're fine with that, but, you know, not any closer, thank you. Yeah. Um, but amazing that they can move that fast, you know, then it all ties back to, you know, their their past and their evolution and uh, things like that. So pr yeah, pretty like amazing. The shape of their yeah. body and, and everything too. Yeah, yeah they've, they've got that speed, as you were saying with the great white, the relationship to the shape of the body still kind of. Um, yeah, definitely. Relates. Normally when they feed in, they're going very slow, you know, one to two knots, you know, you, you as a swimmer, I mean, they, they, they move faster than you can see. So you look at them and they go, oh, they're really slow. I can catch up with that. But you know, mm. as a, a human snorkeler, you're the most, unhydrodynamic thing in the in the world so know, you know, it's so disappointing <laughs> but it's not like a you know a mako that's zipping about zzz, going all yeah. over the place you know they're just smooth and slow and steady and then next thing bam one jumps out the water and it's like two complete opposites of you know yeah behavior yeah cool. and i guess in relationship to the size of your boat like you know get let's give some uh relationship to the size what, what size are we talking here uh, well, they are, well, in reference books, they're known to grow up to 12 meters. Um, but I think most people accept that about 10 is, would be the kind of rough maximum size. Um, the average size class that we get is kind of five to seven meters. A really big one would be eight or nine. Um, and our ribs are kind of nine to 12 meters long. So, you know, the, the bigger ones are getting up there with the size of the, the size of the boat, which is pretty, yeah. pretty big for, a, a, you know, a kind of great white looking shark kind of thing yeah um, and i think one of the things that's impressed me the most is from your incredible photographs that i've seen so many of um is the size of the dorsal fin when you see yeah. a snorkeler's head next to it it's it's well, mighty in yeah. its size right and i'm guessing you know you're you're talking about your regular size are around the eight meters um how big is a dorsal fin yeah, they, well, they can be up to a meter tall, so like absolutely massive. So you know, they, they're they're so big when they're when they're when they're really up at the surface. Most of that fins out the water, and they're so big. Sometimes they kind of you know flop over, um, mm. and then on like say on a on a hot sunny day, um, one of the techniques to actually spot the sharks is the sun bouncing off the fin like a glint that like you would get on a car windscreen or a, or a mirror type thing, mm -hmm. uh, because they're so big. Um, and actually, going back into history, uh, one of the old names for them was a sailfish, and that was because one of the the, the fin was kind of, you know, you know, Slapping compared around. to a sailfish because they were so big, you know, they would flap around and all the rest of it. Uh, okay. But yeah, like, but then if you see the shark underwater, uh, you know, and every, the whole fin's underwater, you get you know a, a, a good perspective of it there, and it has absolutely you know massive kind of thing, yeah. and even things like the pectorals are really big as well. Yeah. So it's quite uh, they're pretty amazing in terms of their you know, how they look. Um, so you, and so then, of course, there's crazy head. 
Sorry. Yeah. You, you mentioned the, um, the size of the brain and, um, and I, I read in a, a bit of the information of your site in relationship to the, um, the nerval mass for their smelling. Um, mm. Is that nerval mass all stored in that bizarre looking nose? Is, is that why? Yeah, so, yeah sh- like other sharks, they have the ampullae of Lorenzini and, you know, they're detecting electrical currents. Um, but they're still very mysterious in terms of being studied, you know, they're... they're they're so obscure with all these, you know, things that they've evolved into. But in terms of the shark, they are just so evolved to be efficient at what they're doing because what they eat is so small and they need to really be put everything into being as as efficient as they possibly can and being able to detect that plankton really well. So obviously it seems that smell is quite a big one. The plankton, the zooplankton they eat uh, inside of them, um, I can try and describe it, but it'd be like a tiny little shrimp that's kind of... um, uh, colorless but it's got a little red um, line in the middle mm. but that that's a lipid body so that's the fat so probably uh you know as waves and and you know things get broken down some of that fat's released um and that's when we can get these kind of natural slicks on the surface which helps us obviously mm. find the, the zones of plankton um but underwater i guess that gives off some kind of smell and that's maybe how the sharks are are um, detecting them how far away that uh, you know they can do that is is a bit tricky to to figure out but their eyesight is also really poor as well so it's uh, I don't think they quite understand the relationship between smell and sight and you know they're they're eating these tiny little mm-hmm. things got, got big eyes um, yeah. I think they generally think that eyesight's maybe for last minute avoidance of um, obstacles but the smell is you know for detecting things and maybe the ampullae use them just for <clears throat> detecting the, the thickest plankton because when we when you see the, the really thickest adult stages of that plankton that's when they really go hard at feeding and mm. they can really turn on a turn on a penny uh, and really mm. move into that zone um, and then they're uh, if, if we get it right at the surface sometimes when you're snorkeling maybe the top uh, you know half a meter or so um, is just absolutely thick with that and the sharks are almost bending up backwards with their mouth out trying to you know get all that in because that's that's you know they're getting the biggest bang for their buck yes eating those, those particular um size class of of copepods so yeah so everything's that, basically evolved to get that you know yeah those, um, so that kind of brings up my question in regards to the way that they feed they're not just scooping and just keeping on going are they almost like the whale shark in the sense that they they have a suction they, they're actually drawing that in towards them or or not yeah so what what it's called is um uh, is passive ram filtration so basically what they're doing is like just basically opening their mouth and then swimming along uh and then letting that water pass through so there's no there's no suction at all they're just basically swimming with their mouth open and okay. then they've got these um organs called the gill rakers which is like a whale's baleen um and you know the, the kind of hairy yes. bananas i guess you call it <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's mucus on that so that traps the um traps the plankton and then once once they are filled up they'll close their mouth and then swallow it down but then just open up so there's no <clears throat> uh, there's no intentional, you know, chewing or sucking or anything like that. They're literally just swimming around with their mouth open, you know, like yeah. uh, we would be if there was, I don't know, Mars bars floating around in the air. We were just walking around <laughs> with our mouth open, letting them go in. So, uh, but again, if you can imagine a basin shark, if it opens its mouth, how much energy it would take for it to swim against with that. You know, it's like you're swimming with a, you know, a dustbin lid in front of you. You can imagine how much energy it would take for you to do that. So, Anytime they open that mouth, it needs to be, you know, optimal conditions for them to do that because of the energy cost of them actually just doing that. Um, so uh, really interesting in terms of that, you know, efficiency of feeding and, you know, uh, when they feed and when, when don't they feed. We, you, you touched on briefly in regards to the teeth that they have. Um, is it uh, similar to the whale shark in the sense that they do have teeth, but they're really not uh, used for feeding, but they're maybe used for mating or something else? Can you explain that? Yeah, exactly. So um, on, the, uh, on the outside of their mouth, they've still got, they've got actually lots and lots of little tiny teeth. Um, so... Uh, Generally, it's, it's thought that they're mainly used for mating because I'm sure everyone knows how sharks mate. Uh, and we actually see a lot of scarring on the pectoral fins yep. um, and on the, the pelvic fins, things like that. Um, so 
we're, because the reason why we have so many, we see a lot of um, mating behavior uh, type activities. So we think that the breaching is to do with that. We see nose to tail following. We see all this pectoral scarring and it's like a big aggregation of them all. So yeah. <clears throat> the islands here, we think at this time, that's, that's a kind of breeding aggregation. So that's generally it's thought that's what they're used for. I mean, they could be vestigial from, you know, back in the back in the day when they were maybe a bit closer to their great white cousins or whatever. But um, definitely these days, it's they're only used for for mating and, and almost I mean, there's well, if you're looking at, a, you know, an eight or 10 meter long animal, you don't really notice the two, two millimeter teeth in front of you. You're looking at the, the big meter mouth that's coming that's towards you. But yeah. Once you've seen enough, then you start to look at some of the actual details and, you know, I guess if you're, you know, us or whatever, we kind of look at them quite differently sometimes to the, you know, the clients because we're looking at funny things like the little teeth or looking for weird things like parasites or these yeah. whereas other people are just like, wow, look at the mouth and, you know, this. Yeah. We're like, oh, yeah, I kind of forgot about that because we're looking at this obscure thing. Yes. Um, so, yeah. And so with, um, I think one of the things that I find really interesting, because I've spent lots of time traveling around the world and walking through markets and seeing sharks, you know, um, and sometimes you get the, the good fortune of um, seeing, you know, um, multiple pups in, in a female that's out on mm. the market. Um, how is it that the basking shark you know, develops their young? Like, is it, is it live pups? Are they, are they a giant egg case that's like hanging <laughs> off your kelp? I don't know. How, how yeah. is it the basking shark? Yeah, funnily enough, we actually have um, huge uh, rays here called skate and they give off huge, um, I've actually got one over there. Uh, I've got some a smaller one, but they give off huge egg cases. So they're probably about the size of my hand, but basking sharks are live bearers. Um, and interestingly, they think the gestation period is about 18 months long. Um, uh, and obviously around here is mating, um, but we very, very rarely see any young or juveniles. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen two, I think, over all the years we've been operating, um, but many other people don't either. Um, so it's generally thought that pupping happens somewhere else, uh, but we don't actually know that. Um, there's very little information or, or sightings um, or studies into that just because it happens somewhere else and nowhere in Norway mm -hmm. is. They do migrate from well, whether way you look at it, they migrate to us from the subtropics and then they go back that way in the, in the winter time. So off of kind of West Africa, out in the mm -hmm. Bay of Biscay, uh, and they head to deep water. So I think most people understand that that's probably the pupping time there um, or maybe somewhere on the way. Um, there was a record from a Norwegian fisherman who had caught one um, back in the day. Uh, and they <clears throat> basically, there was, uh, it was a mother that was pregnant uh, it spontaneously gave birth as they um, as he hauled it out. There was one that it was uh, that lived and went back into the water and started feeding immediately. So uh, oh. there was obviously then a, a <clears throat> some kind of sense that you know it had to start feeding you know immediately from there. So perhaps where they are um, where they're given birth is an area where the, the food is still around. Yeah. Um, and it's it's quite interesting. Some of the tagging that's gone on has showed that they go to deep water around March time. Um, in the subtropics uh, and there is talk of uh, plankton being around that uh, depth layer at that time of year as well so mm -hmm. maybe that's you know away from predators deep water there's food available there's so many mysteries about them that, you know they have such a huge range you, you know they're they're actually you know all around the world you have them in Australia New Zealand or you know mainly New Zealand but maybe the South South Australia would get them you know they're they're seen, they have been seen around South Africa they've crossed the equator you see them in the wow. states they're just so wide ranging but you know where we just have the peak of the aggregation because they seem to you know come to us to breed uh, and you, we've got you know the a, a lot of uh, food for them in the summertime so yeah. uh, there's also been a lot of hunting and eradication programs around the world yeah. as well I guess so, that, uh, was, that was my next question and that was uh, you know what threats have basking sharks uh, been faced with and and how how are they being protected now and um, yeah that leads into that for me thanks yeah, so uh, again, this is a, <laughs> a long, a long conversation. Um, but like starting off with Scotland, we are in. We had last year was the public consultation of a marine protected area for them. Okay. Um, so that then has to go to the government to decide um, if they're going to do that. But 
if that was to go through and most people agree that it should be, um, we would have the very first world's, uh, world's first uh, marine protected area for bass and sharks, mm. which would be really, really cool to have. Yes. Um, although um, with their protection, um, they're actually heavily protected as a species here anyway. So the MPA probably wouldn't really give them any more protection. It would just maybe introduce give them a, a good better title. management. Yeah, so that would be pretty cool. Yeah, um, but they're, they're as a species, they've been heavily protected for a number of years, but it's only been around, um, well, what would that be? It would be 25 years that uh, they've stopped hunting them. So our, our last shark that was hunted in Scotland was 1994. So not, you know, not that long ago. Yeah. Uh, and they were, uh, I mean, the last, the last operation was, you know, reasonably small, but it was similar to whaling where it was a harpoon gun on the front. Uh, yeah. And the, the liver is about a third to a quarter of their body weight. Um, and that's a big energy store. Uh, and that was used for oil, you know, and back in the olden days, similar to like lamps and, and, and oils and stuff like that. But yeah. later on, the, the, the oil is very pure. So it was even used in, uh, you know, aeronautics. And I think even mm. for... NASA used it for some obscure, um, okay. you know, instruments and things like that. So, uh, so it was very sought after. But over like the um, the twentieth century, they think it's about um, hundred thousand sharks were taken out of the Northeast Atlantic, um, generally around Scotland, Ireland, and Norway, um, because obviously they, they we had the biggest numbers, um, and there was a quota trade as well. So uh, obviously Scotland was a, a big fishing nation. Uh, or, or you know reasonably still is uh, and same with Norway uh, but in Norway they had more of the herring and mackerel mm. so what happened is the the, the Scottish government then um, uh, negotiated with the Norwegians and said well we'll trade you some Baskin sharks for some herring so the Scottish boats could go over and fish the herring mm. and the Norwegian boats could come over and fish the Baskin sharks so there was large fleets came over from Norway that were uh, and it was the opposite time from their whaling so their whaling season was in the winter and then yeah. they and then they had all the equipment, right? If they were whaling already, then they had the yep, right equipment exactly. to do what they needed. Yeah. So there's lots of old pictures from, say, the 40s and 50s of the their fleet, you know, around Scotland. And, you know, they've got yeah. the lookout posts and all those things. So they, they were huge numbers taken out. Um, but they seem to have, I mean, the last, the, the last kind of big operation was maybe 50s. So, you know, they've had a good uh, recovery time from the really intense period. Um, uh, and obviously the, the one in the, in the late age, age 90s didn't take a huge amount of numbers. And then from there, we've had another kind of 25 years of uh, recovery around here. Um, mm. So in terms of that, you know, they're doing not too bad as a species. They are known as endangered on the IUCN red list. Yes. Um, and one of their kind of issues is their migration path. So obviously when they come to us in Scotland in the summertime, um, they are heavily protected, you know, and we may have this MPA, but then when they migrate to the subtropics, they probably go into the high seas and through maybe five or six other countries, you yes. know, imaginary yes. borders in the ocean. Um, and they may not have the same protection that we have. And obviously there's unregulated fishing and different things that go on. Yeah. Um, we, we don't think there's a lot of, I mean, they're certainly not targeted anymore because there's many other uh, international trade barriers on, you know, them getting sold for fins and things like that. Yeah. Um, they may get caught occasionally in bycatch. We do hear of it uh, occasionally on the high seas and things, but yeah. I don't think that's a, a really big threat for them as a population at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is things like uh, plastics, which we're looking at. So yeah. as a filter feeder, they feed in these areas of plankton, but the currents that accumulate this plankton is also areas where um, you know floating plastic would, would concentrate and as that breaks down it goes into microplastics and yeah. perhaps yeah. into small um, pieces the same size as their prey so one yeah. of the things we're looking at in some of our scientific trips is uh, you know doing um, uh, plankton sampling and we're looking for microplastics and trying to get uh, uh, some numbers around you know if the shark was feeding in this area and this is how much plastic was contained there uh, you know this this is the kind of effect so yeah um, they may block their stomachs we don't we don't get too many that wash up to to be able to sample them um, yeah. which is good but not good if we're trying to figure out if it's an effect or not yeah uh, but we can obviously do it non-invasively and uh you know be able to get some data around that but generally you know they're not they're not actively targeted as for fishing or for fins nowadays anyway so um thankfully they're they're doing not too bad given our previous history with them um, yeah. so hopefully yeah. as we as we go on our, our our recent issues 
won't affect them and they'll just continue to grow because we do tell people on the tours you know obviously we're talking about this stuff you know imagine if those hundred thousand sharks were still there because they are long lived like other ones um you know we see you know some of the days what are you thinking um well they think definitely over 50 years um and they don't mature and you know uh, for a good long while so uh it's, it's never been sampled unlike the kind of greenland shark and stuff um mm -hmm. but definitely they're 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 pretty long lived and there's definitely there'll be sharks around that were around in the hunting days or whatever um but yeah imagine imagine there was you know thousands and thousands of sharks that we would see rather than hundreds kind of thing yeah um, and there is like historical records of, you know, uh, and books of, you know, them seeing fins as far as the, you know, you could see and all these things. But oh, really? Oh, incredible. We do, we do see that in a smaller extent these days. Um, but, you know, um, imagine what it was like, you know, yeah. 75 years ago or something. It would have been absolutely incredible. Yeah. So you have been recording basking shark sightings since about 2012 and have a long-term project to monitor and uh, monitor the distribution and abundance of the sharks. Have you experienced a positive impact on the numbers of sightings since isolation with lockdown with COVID-19? Um, or what other positive impacts might you have seen with basking sharks in their environment? Um, uh, yeah, interesting. Uh, well, because of lockdown, we've not really been out to see them yet. So it's highly frustrating to <laughs> not get out there. Um, okay. Interestingly enough, uh, I don't think there's been any um, positive or negative influence on them as a species due to it, just because where they live is actually pretty isolated from population anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So really, it's, it's not like, a, you know, if we're a busy area where humans are really doing impact on them every day. They, 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 they go to islands that are, are very... Um, uh, sparsely populated and they have a migration out into the Atlantic so um, you know maybe there was a slight less uh, level of shipping but um, that's probably not had too much of an effect an interesting side of it is on their migration up they pass through maybe like you know the south coast of England and Ireland and things um, and we did have very very good weather unfortunately or fortunately um, during <laughs> lockdown uh, you know we had I think they said it was like the best spring we've had in a hundred oh, years or something no. it's like oh. of course it would be when you can't leave the house it's like oh yeah and there's loads of well. I'm sure for that. Um, but i'm not sure because of lockdown and because people weren't working and they were just you know getting out to walk around the coast and because we had these offshore winds the inshore waters were actually very calm so they maybe came closer into land um, mm. and the conditions were much better for them being spotted. So actually a lot have been seen this spring already, but it's probably because of those, um, those conditions uh, you know, that have been and favorable. what people are doing in their behaviors rather than, you know, uh, us uh, not disturbing them as much or, or yeah. things like that. They've come um, to do what they've named for, you know, I guess, basking shark. I guess they got their name because of an old, I, my understanding is that, I, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, basking shark is because they basked in the sun and that's how they first saw them. Is that, is that part yeah, of yeah, that? Well, yeah, nearly there. We actually wrote a blog on this recently because they actually, their name is sort of wrong. So um, back in the day, they were actually, their name, their name comes from kind of Scotland and Ireland. So they were known as... Um, an old name for them is also known as sunfish. So, but there's also the o ocean sunfish, the mola mola. Yeah. So yeah. they kind of knew them as a sunfish. So back in the day, they probably, because what happens in, you kind of have to understand the backstory and, and the signs behind it. So during hot, sunny conditions, the plankton is able to come to the surface because it's not getting disturbed by waves and all those things. And mm -hmm. that's when the sharks come to the surface because that's where all the plankton is. Mm -hmm. So the old people probably, you know, um, put two and two together and got five and, you know, just put the sun and the sharks and that was related. But the kind of sun in settled conditions was the plankton. So they were nearly there. Yeah. Um, and then there was a, a naturalist that renamed the Baskin sharks, uh, sorry, well, renamed it from sunfish to Baskin shark to avoid the clash with the mola mola. Yeah. But they just assumed from sunfish that it was Baskin. So we've had like oh. two sets of wrong assumptions. So they're now called Baskin sharks, but they don't bask. Um, yeah. But so it's more to do with the plankton, and you know, during those conditions, you would generally see more of them because the, it's optimal kind of thing. Yeah. But that's not to say that we don't see them when it's raining and waves and all the rest of it. It really depends on the plankton. So if if it's very dense plankton and it's really really choppy, the sharks are still at the surface eating them. But it, it really depends on what's happening in the water column. 
So it's quite funny how that, you know, all all comes back down to these tiny little, tiny yeah. little cocoa pots. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's all about the food, huh? <laughs> yeah. That, that. Yeah. Look, I have a few more questions, but we have just spoken for way longer than I thought. And I've absolutely enjoyed uh, sharing in your knowledge and your wonderful stories. Thanks so much for taking time for us. And uh, we really look forward to, to coming out and swimming around and spending some time in your amazing backyard in 2022. And uh, the basking shark has definitely uh, moved up on my uh, experience, must do experience list. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Well, good to talk to you and send through any questions that you might have and happy to answer anything and all the rest of it. And then hopefully you'll see, see our wee sharkies yeah. in a couple of years time. This is all over and you guys can make it over. So they'll yeah. be there when you're ready. So we'll be ready for you then. Excellent. Thanks so much, Shane. Good to talk to you. Yeah, you too.